We're with Friends of the 10 Mile River Watershed. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation of the 10 Mile River within the state of Massachusetts. Obviously, we care about the environment of the 10 Mile River and its watershed. Uh, but when we started doing this, we all decided that we also wanted to incorporate its history as well. So this is definitely something that we're completely into. Um, and we're very lucky uh, that on our board we have Don Doucette, who has been an advocate for the Ten Mile River a little bit longer than I have, a um, <laughs> couple years, and uh, a lifelong resident of Attleboro. So I'm gladly going to let him uh, take you through this presentation because it uh, doesn't make any sense for me to just relay the information that I've gotten from him. He's, he's been a mentor to me for the last 20-something uh, years since I've been doing this and uh, you know I'm very lucky to to have him uh, on our board of directors now so I'm gonna hand the microphone over to him and uh, he'll take us through uh, the river that built this city. Thank you. Thank you Ben. The river that built this city that's a wide ranging subject and I don't think we can cover the entire subject this evening but let's try and give it a try. I would think that most of us in this room have been cultured to think of things that have happened in the watershed in the city from the mind of the, a European culture uh, for the most part. And I think that what we know and what we experience, have experienced in the Ten Mile River watershed, the general subject of the mills, what this building represents, the agriculture that was in the area and now is gone, is of a European history. It's a, it's a history of the bounding of the land. And the bounding of the land began the, when the first boats from Europe hit the shores of North America. And with the, with the boats from Europe hitting the shores of North America and the people exiting from those boats with an intent to settle the process of bounding the land started immediately. And what happened at that point was a clash of two cultures. One culture would overwhelm and dominate another culture because their life ways and lifestyles and beliefs didn't mesh. And it was only a matter of time before there was uh, friction between these two cultures and the European culture in about 400 years. We have about 400 years of history here, recorded history. But what I'm talking about when I talk about history of the Ten Mile River watershed, there are thousands of years of unrecorded history no written record. Those people who knew the history through oral tradition were subjugated and gone and their culture was diminished. So the oral traditions of the early history of the peoples who were here ceased to exist. And in more later years we've depended on science to give us the answers of the life ways that happened here in the Ten Mile River watershed. When we think of the European development of the watershed, we all can relate to water power, steam power, damming of the river, damming of the tributaries, to the point where those things created the essence of the development of the center of Attleboro 
we had mills here. Union Street was the heart of it. We know that. We had a steam company across the street that piped steam to factories all up and down here. Uh, Union Street, Dunham Street. And then what happened at that time? What happened? We had one of the biggest fires that ever hit the center of Attleboro. And it burned from down Union Street, uh, Dunham, part of Dunham Street, burned a fire barn down, of all things. The fire barn got caught in it. And a miracle happened here in Attleboro. The industrialists who were burned out, for the most part, made a decision to stick, stick it out and hang in. And I think there were only a few who didn't re, re-institute their businesses following that great Attleboro fire. And to make up for the loss of buildings, I believe, prove me wrong, the Bigney building on the other side was built for the redevelopment of the center of Attleboro after that great fire. Check it out. But what I'm saying is, we, we know basically the history of, of the development of Attleboro. And the Ten Mile River has been running through the heart of it since, since, since re- recorded, before recorded time. The Ten Mile River was birthed And the face of Attleboro was birthed when the last great Wisconsin glacier melted and receded here in our local area. Ah, the face of Attleboro literally fell from the ice randomly. And when the water drained off the landscape, in this portion of of the landscape, the thing that we call the Ten Mile River, River Corridor was born. And during that time, the environment of the Att- of Attleboro here, uh, uh, the whole area, was very, very harsh. Subarctic conditions, tundra conditions that we think of of Canada in the north, north parts. We had herds of animals roaming through here. We had caribou and those things. And the peoples who took these resources from the south or from the west predominantly as the land warmed populated the Attleboro area. Unrecorded, unwritten, unknown to us. I think there's a case of artifacts out here in the museum display that is just a minuscule portion of the lifeways that went on here in the Ten Mile River watershed. And I contend, or have contended for some years, that the Ten Mile River and a number of smaller watersheds to our west and to our east between the two great rivers of the Blackstone River and the Taunton River to the east, that a system of small watersheds and brooks, brook-type watersheds, all had a common place that they flowed to. And that was to what eventually became Narragansett Bay. And we are very Narragansett Bay oriented here in the Attleboro's, North Attleboro, Plainville, Attleboro, Seacon, Pawtucket, East Providence, Rumford, all parts of the Ten Mile River watershed. And, and the, our orientation geologically and ge- geographically is toward Narragansett Bay. And when the early peoples moved into this area, as the bay formed and, and life evolved in the bay, I contend that the people who eventually came into Attleboro during this unrecorded historic period, had a connection to the estuaries to our south on on Narragansett Bay. 
and, and they had a thousands of years to do this now, life, life ways evolved, the technologies evolved. And they were in an industry where they had to make their own things. They didn't, they didn't have factories. They didn't have the, the ability to create uh, grist mills or, or water powered mills. The things, their manufacturing processes were in their minds <coughs> and in the abilities, dexterity of their bodies, their hands and feet and legs and arms. And they built their cultures. It was a very precarious existence. And those peoples that associated with the Ten Mile River watershed and the early peopling of the city of Attleboro, what became the city of Attleboro, evolved. They evolved from hunt, great hunters that followed the herds. There was very little settlement during that period. I don't think we have uh, historic evidence of a paleo site in Ten Mile River watershed, not that I know of. But as the, as the landscape warmed and things warmed, the, the types of trees started to change, the types of things that they collected off the land uh, started to change, the animal, uh, animals around them. And I say this, we have a problem today with dams. We want to tear our old industrial dams down and free our rivers. The Ten Mile River and the 400 years of recorded history, the river and watershed has been grossly abused. And I'll say that right out, right up front. And we who are interested presently <coughs> in the well-being of the Ten Mile River and its watershed and water public water supplies, we are trying to undo the parts of the neglect that had taken place in 400 years. And I'm contending that damming the, of the watershed was not a new concept. That the damming of the Ten Mile River watershed after the glacial ice sheet uh, receded, that there was a wide ranging system of damming in the watershed. But a human hand didn't touch it. Not one human hand touched, touched the process. What made the dams? Beavis. Beaver. And that with any, any, any watershed, any brook in this area, they're all over North America, was a tremendous <laughs> population of beavers. You go today to remote cameras that people put out in the wild. You know, we have these cameras now today. People strap them to a tree. Watch, watch the uh, recordings taking that beaver dams and see the animal life that comes to a beaver dam or goes through the area of a beaver dam. A beaver dam is like a natural magnet. It will attract or help promote from microscopic life to the largest mammals available. And I've, I've looked at remote camera, modern camera settings from beaver dams. And depending on where you are, but if you were in Maine, you'd see bear and moose and coyotes and wild, the wild cats and the smaller mammals. Those ponds uh, supported aquatic, the aqu all the aquatic things that were natural to the Ten Mile River watershed. And I'm saying that damming was a common thing here in our watershed. And when the European culture hit and when Attleboro was settled, the first place that the settler, the early settler in Attleboro, the, you read the histories. What did they go after? Cleared meadows. They were after the old Indian garden sites, the old Indian native 
uh, sites that they would come to uh, from the, in the summer. Family, just small family groups, extended families. They'd pitch a wee two here in Attleboro or any place around here and for a summer grow their, 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 their crops, their corn, their beans, their squashes and their, their pumpkins. We had it all here. But what the European culture brought was the process of systematically damming the rivers. And what we did, we, we disrupted the lifeways of our, our watershed. We disrupted the ancient adronomous fish that came up, like the salmon. We had salmon here, we had herring, we had it all. We had it all here. And those processes were interrupted. And then when the mills were built uh, first for water power, and then when steam came, that really altered the face of, of Attleboro. Because a decision was made, uh, steam powered railroads. And then when, the, when it was planned to put railroad through East Attleboro or North Attleboro, the engineers developed two possible routes. One was a straight route to Back Bay in Boston. We know Back Bay today. And we know it connects to the rail line here today. Nothing new. Engineers decided that in the, what, 1830s or 40s? And when the rail line, the main rail line, was put through East Attleboro, what we call the center of Attleboro today, and put right through basically a block over, a block over here. It wasn't elevated like it is today. It was grade level. And those trains went through East, old East Attleboro, grade level, right by the Attleboro Common. In the center, the center of East Attleboro, I, I'm contending, prove me wrong, shifted from an agrarian, agricultural, center, which we may call Farmer's Village today, and when a steam, line, steam train line went through, what did it bring? It brought the ability to develop commerce. And what did the rail line through East Attleboro bring? It brought a direction, a direct connection to worldwide commerce. This East Attleboro Podunk farming village suddenly was connected to the world and we could trade with the world and manufacturers said we want to be near that line because we now with steam power we can build our goods manufacture our goods put it on those railroad cars and that's what it was in the beginning was a rail a commercial freight line and by that train line connected to Providence, which, which was a seaport, or toward Boston, which was a great seaport. But it didn't make it to, to Boston all at once. It made it to Canton and stopped. And if you travel the train to Canton today, you cross a Romanesque viaduct. And it was an engineering marvel. Because what that, that Romanesque viaduct created was an uninterrupted passage by these fr early freight trains to Back Bay and Boston. And what did that train going to Back Bay and Boston do? It created commerce on that end. And it caused the Back Bay to be filled in in Boston. It caused the hills of, part of Beacon Hill being leveled down a bit. And the hills out in, out in uh, Newton in Wellesley, out in that general area where 128 runs through today, all that gravel was trucked into, <coughs> trained into Boston to fill Back Bay. I'm getting away from the subject of Attleboro, <coughs> but what I'm saying is East Attleboro began to develop, and those minds, those entre entrepreneurs who had the minds to 
suddenly begin to make metal things, things out of metal, machine tooling, jewelry. And Don, if it wasn't jewelry, that literally put, put East Attleboro on, on the map for, for manufacture. I'm, I'm one of the Balfour River rats. I, I, I worked at Balfour's for a short time in my life. And I bet most of the people in this room have a connection to industry here in what we call Attleboro, but, but was East Attleboro. I think we all share, and share somehow in the culture. I saw the World Series rings. I was taken across the Ten Mile River one day on the bridge behind Firestone by my boss. He came into my department one day, Howard, Howard Brown, and he did this to me. So I said, oh Jesus, I did something wrong. <laughs> he says, follow me. Okay, he's the boss. I thought I, I was going to his office for a tongue lashing, for something I might have done wrong. No, he walked out of the apartment. He told me to come. I followed him. I walked out. Followed him down where the tubs were in Balfour's, where all the chemicals were for the plating. Through that, the, the strange smells in that area. Now I'm down to river level in Balfour building, going through parts of the building I'd never seen. Pipes, wires, cables. Next thing I know, we're going through a door, and I'm walking over a bridge over the Ten Mile River. I'm just following the guy. We get into the Firestone building through another door. Now we cross the river. <laughs> we take a right. We're going through the building. <clears throat> uh, we, go up, we go up the corridor. And he, before we went through the door into the room we were going into, he stopped me. And he said, we're going in here now through this door. He says, and I'm going to point to a spot on the floor. And when you get in there, you stand on this spot and don't make a move. <laughs> All right? This is my boss <laughs> at Balfour. We go through the door. <clears throat> I get into the, the room behind us. It's, it's a, it's a uh, brewery today. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Jesus. I get in the room. Pardon my English. And there's a truck backed in, into the room, an armored truck, an armored truck. And there's guys all around the room with guns, <laughs> guns, all right? And that's why he told me, stand on this spot that I point to and don't move. I, I tell you, they could have glued me there and I wouldn't have moved for all the tea in China. And on a cart on wheels at the back end of that truck. This is a true story. There's a crate on this wheeled device. And there's a guy with a clipboard and a, and a pencil. And next thing I know, a guy comes with a hammer and a pinch bar. And he starts prying the, 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 the crate apart. He dismantled that crate right in front of my eyes. And when he took the wood off of that crate, I saw a pile of gold bricks. Honest, like I've never seen in my life, or will never see in my life again. That was just one gold shipment coming to Balfour's. And when we talk about the development of, the, of East Attleboro, from a water power to steam power to industry, that one incident to me said it all. Because we had we had developed <clears throat> such great wealth here in Attleboro. We had a lot of money power here in Attleboro in the heyday of, of the jewelry industry. And I was in Balfour's <clears throat> toward the tail end of that heyday, and I didn't know it. I had no, no inkling that the jewelry industry in Attleboro would in a decade. Am I right or wrong, people? Almost in a decade. Moved. It went overseas. It went to East Providence. It went to Texas. And then what went to East Providence? Uh, uh, Providence, uh, Point Street Bridge area. That all moved. Texas, you name it. China, Singapore. 
Our jewelry industry, for the most part, poof, gone. Jeez, here we are, a culture coming from the, the European process of the European culture. And those people that came here and developed industry and settlements came from Europe where the tribal peoples and the peoples who depended on waters and fens and, and, and water systems were subjugated and done away with. Read the story of the, of the Fenland people in East Anglia, where, where the Albr our Attleboro roots come from, for the most part, our history. We had a lot of people come to the Attleboro area from, from what I read, or have read, East, the East Anglia region of, of Britain. What happened there? Sheep, sheep, the, the, the noblemen knew they could make money with sheep. They, they put the fens, the ancient fens people off the land, off, off the waterways, the fens. And what did they do in Europe? They filled in the fens. And they kicked the people off the what was the term for that when they kicked the people off the land? Uh, uh, yeah, there's another, there's another historic word. For, uh, replace me, uh, I don't know. I can't bring it to mind now. But that's, that's the cultural process that, that the folks that came from Europe brought. Filled our wetland, uh, wetland waterfronts here on the Ten Mile River squeeze the river in. Now we have flooding problems. We have public water supply problems. We know that Plainville is struggling to maintain their water supply. North Attleboro struggles. They've, you've read in the newspaper about tainted, tainted mill uh, 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 wells in North Attleboro. <coughs> North Attleboro selling water to Plainville to, to make up their systems. This summer, a near catastrophe, as far as I'm concerned, was a, a summer of uh, a brutal realization. You know, when Hoppin Hill Reservoir dries up to mud, to cracked mud, and then we discover a, a, a thriving invasive plant in Luther Reservoir, we begin to say amongst ourselves, God, that's the water supply of Attleboro. And if you don't maintain an ecological balance in, in the ponds and impoundments that supply your public water, then that means the quality of your public water supply is being compromised. And it hit us like a ton of bricks this summer. And I said, when it got at its worst point, I said to Ben that our salvation this summer was the shift in season. That usually when the hurricanes come down in Florida and those systems come up the East Coast, any drought that we've had locally is, is satisfied with the rains that come from the hurricanes. What didn't we have this summer? We didn't have the rains from hurricanes. Right? And that's when it got to be, it got to be uh, very concerning to, to see Hoppin Hill, both Hoppin Hills dried up and the Seven Mile River hardly flowing. Not flowing in a lot of areas. Not flowing, yeah. not seven, flowing. The Seven Mile River was hit hard. And then with, with, a, with, a, with a invasive plant situation in Luther Reservoir, and Luther Reservoir being what? The, the impoundment supply for what's pumped to Manchester Reservoir. Because Manchester Reservoir uh, can't, doesn't get enough water flow to justify the amount of water that it stores. It's all pumped from below by pumps up above. And then what's released, what doesn't go into our public water, water system, the overflow of the release is Four Mile Brook, Four Mile Brook. which is down along South Avenue, near with Tiffany Street. It's a little red maple swamp. 
it was beautiful just recently. The, the red maples are the first to change in that little brook. And now all those leaves have fallen. I, I'm, I'm digressing in my thought processes here. But what I'm trying to say is, let, let, me, ra let me boil it down, that our history, the Ten Mile River history, of, of what we know of as Attleboro, we know of in part. And science has helped us to develop the known parts of, of unrecorded history. So the Ten Mile River has been the main natural resource for the existence and the development of what eventually became our Attleboro. And I guess I've kind of gone a re around in a real, a real circle. We've been to Europe. We've been to, to the Wisconsin, last Wisconsin glacier. We've been the prehistoric peoples. Not even going through the, the incremental development of those peoples here. And there was the paleo. They were archaic people. They were the early archaic, middle archaic, late archaic. And then there was a woodland period of native people here in Attleboro. And when Maurice Robbins in his book, The Early Indian History of Attleboro, you get that little book at the library. Maurice Robbins had it right. When, when Dr. Robbins said that Attleboro, before recorded history, was a backwater. Put, summing it up in one word that what we know of as Attleboro today was simply a backwater. And those, those native peoples who had a close association to Narragansett Bay would come up into the Attleboro's or any one of our towns here on our little watersheds and would do their summer food production, their hunting. It was all done by hand and mind. And that is our development of Attleboro. And the river, the term, the river flows through it. The river has flowed through it all and is the silent witness to the development of human history here in our 10-mile river watershed. <laughs>